Today's case is one that's been going wild all over the media with speculation, rumor, and all sorts of theories. I will say that when I looked into this case, it seemed like a very cut and dry situation of a woman who suffered from abuse, tried leaving, and ended up dead. But as we look more into the information, we learn that this case isn't as black and white as it seems. So much of this information came out literally yesterday and today, May 8th, as I'm making this video. So if you haven't watched any recent videos about this case, you are missing out on a lot of very valuable information. But before we get into the case real quick, I want to remind you all that CrimeCon 2024 is only a few weeks away. It is in Nashville this year and is going to take place the last weekend of May going into June. There are going to be so many amazing speakers, so many other inspiring creators there, and I am so, so, so very excited. There are still some tickets left, so if you have not yet gotten your pass, I highly suggest you do so. You can get yourself a discount when you use my code RACHELSHANNON. Let me know down below if I'll be seeing you there. With that being said, let's get into this disturbing case. Micah Miller was born on March 7th, 1994 in Wichita, Kansas to parents Michael Francis and Angela Ramirez. She had four sisters, Anna, Sierra, Abby, and Destiny, and one brother, Nathaniel. After living in Kansas for some time, the family moved to South Carolina in 2007, where they settled. Micah was described by those who knew her as energetic, adventurous, bold, determined, passionate, and giving. She was known to be a hard worker and a risk taker who was determined to succeed at everything she put her mind to. She also loved a good challenge. She went vegan for a year, which was definitely tough for her, but she made it work and loved the challenge of it. Micah loved outdoor activities like waterfall rappelling, hiking, and running. She even went skydiving for fun, which really just speaks to her sense of adventure and willingness to try new things, no matter how scary they might be. Micah was also known as being extremely close to her family and made sure to stay in contact with those she cared about. She also had a little dog, Loki, who she absolutely adored. Overall, Family was such an important thing to Micah. Back in 2009, then 14-year-old Micah met John Paul Miller, who is 14 years older than her. They actually met because Micah was a member of the church youth group at John's church. At first, the two started off as friends, but as they grew closer and closer, their friendship turned into a relationship. Ultimately, the pair married on November 7, 2017, when Micah was about 23 and John was 38. From there, the two were described as being basically inseparable, spending almost every day and night together for the entirety of their relationship. Now, John Paul is a pastor at the Solid Rock Church in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Micah was known as being a great help at the church, doing whatever she could to be an active member of the church. She was the worship leader, the graphics designer, a woman's ministry leader, and the pastor's assistant. Everything she did was with the utmost integrity and faithfulness. Not only at the church, but she wanted to be the best wife she could, serving her husband and Jesus with her whole heart. After a church service, Michael would go out of her way to compliment John Paul, calling him the best or funniest preacher in the world. She wanted to make sure he felt confident and loved. According to her obituary, Micah had five stepchildren, Logan, Zachary, Eli, Asher, and Sela. She did her best to be the best stepmother she could, serving her husband's children and treating them as if they were her own. Now, it isn't totally clear what the situation with the children was, but I did see in one article that these children are from a previous marriage, which ended in 2016. So there is some overlap there between that marriage and when John Paul met Micah. Now, to those on the outside, the relationship between John Paul and Micah appeared to be a solid one. She was the pastor's wife, and that was a role she took seriously. She served her husband, but above all, she served her God. She wanted to be the best wife possible, but behind closed doors, things were not going smoothly for her. Turns out, John Paul was allegedly very abusive, manipulative, and controlling. In the months before her death, she started confiding in her sister about the abuse that she had been suffering at John Paul's hands. Now, in terms of the actual abuse and the specifics of it throughout the entirety of their marriage, we don't have too many specific details about that. 
Again, this is a very recent and ongoing case, so we may find out more, but whatever he was doing caused Micah to start pulling away and confiding in her family. She was asking them for help, telling them that she was fearful. We also know that his behaviors were concerning to some people who were attending the church because at least a few of their members as well as a few of Micah's family members stopped attending the church because they didn't like how John Paul acted. And when Micah started pulling away, that is when John Paul started to act more and more controlling. The whole timeline starts in February of 2023. On February 12th, 2023, Micah and John Paul filed a postnuptial agreement regarding what would happen if they were to divorce. In the documents, the couple agreed that neither would seek alimony. They also listed that their home was owned by the church, so it doesn't count as marital property. Neither would talk negatively about Solid Rock Ministries, and they would keep their personal lives confidential. Both signed these documents, but by March of 2024, the filing was actually dismissed. Later that year, in October of 2023, Micah actually filed for divorce from her husband, but the filing was dismissed, saying that the couple should be able to resolve the issues between them. Then, sometime in late 2023 or early 2024, Micah then confided in her sister that she noticed people following her and tracking her where she went. She believed that John Paul had hired people to follow her around and keep tracks of her whereabouts. Eventually, the stalking got to the point where Micah feared for her safety, so at that time, she did report the stalking to police. Then, Micah found out that John Paul started moving assets so that Micah wouldn't have anything to her name. For example, the deed to the house was actually changed to one of his sons rather than being the property of the church. By February 8th, 2024, Micah had been admitted to a mental health facility for treatment. One source states that she was involuntarily committed by her husband, though she didn't want to be committed herself. At the time that she was committed, her car was left in a Walmart parking lot. While in the hospital, apparently she told staff that her and her husband were unofficially separated since January the prior month. She also confided that John Paul had been grooming her from the age of 10 when they first met at the church until they were married in 2017. Which, even if they did meet at 14 rather than 10, both are equally disturbing. The fact that this grown man in his late 20s to early 30s was talking to a 14-year-old, that's already very, very disturbing and totally wrong. On the outside, while Micah was hospitalized, John Paul started moving Micah's personal belongings out of their home and moved them into an apartment of a friend. This was not something that Micah would have approved of and was done without her knowledge. It was only when she returned home from the hospital on February 10th that Micah found her belongings had been moved. In addition to her stuff from the home being moved after being released, she went back to the Walmart parking lot to get her car. But when she got there, she saw that it was gone. At the time, she knew that John Paul had stolen her car and wouldn't tell her where he moved it to. At that time, Micah filed a complaint with the police to report the car as stolen. When police followed up with John Paul about the car, he told officers that he and Micah weren't legally separated. He said that she suffers from mental health disorders where she experiences episodes on an annual basis, usually around Christmas. She starts to become reckless and spends large amounts of money when she stops taking her medications. When it comes to the car, it was marital property, so he told police that he did take the car and was unwilling to return it. He said that she was still within her reckless time frame, so he didn't want her to have it. It was for her own good. At the time, it was determined that because the couple is still legally married, the vehicle was marital property, so this did not qualify as a criminal offense. Now, going back to the weeks before she went to the hospital, Micah started gathering evidence that she was going to use to support her claims against John Paul when she planned to file for divorce. She had several different documents, emails, files, pictures, all sorts of information that showed that John Paul was not treating her well. But, 
After she got back from the hospital, she found that all of those files had been removed from her laptop. She also couldn't access her own iCloud account anymore, her email, or her Facebook. Unfortunately, she was never able to recover those documents, and of course, the speculation here is that her husband, John Paul, removed those documents from her devices. It's also suspected that John Paul accessed her accounts like her Facebook and email and was sending emails from her accounts pretending to be her. So up to this point, we can see that Micah was beginning to take the steps towards separating from her husband. She was confiding in family members about John Paul's violent behaviors and she was getting evidence to show that he was abusive. It's not a coincidence in my opinion that she separated from him in January then he has her involuntarily committed. And then while she's committed, allegedly, he starts moving his assets and removing Micah's personal property from the home and then going on her devices and deleting documents. That seemed very intentional. While all of this was going on, Micah continued to confide in her sister. She started talking about her life after divorce, things that she was looking forward to. Back in October of 2023, Michael had traveled to Kenya on a missions trip through the church. When she got back, she told her sister that after the divorce, she wanted to live part-time in Kenya to continue her work. She had even shipped some of her belongings to Kenya to start the process. But at the same time, she told her sister that she was scared to file for divorce. She said that she was afraid her life would be taken from her if she left John Paul, even saying to her sister, quote, if I end up with a bullet in my head, it was not me, it was John Paul. Then on March 11th, 2024, Micah called the Horry County Police to report that a tire on her car had been damaged while she was at the Spring Maid Pier. In the report, she said that when she got into her car at the pier, she heard a pop sound when she started driving. She looked at the tire to see what happened and she found that someone put a razor blade in the tire. This was actually the second time that week that she found a razor in her tire. After an officer arrived on scene, he helped her change to a spare tire, and then Micah left and went to a gas station to get gas. Micah said that while she was at the gas station, John Paul pulled up to her and tried speaking with her. She told him to go away, that she didn't want to talk. Then when she pulled out her phone to start recording the incident, he sped off. She then took her car to the Honda dealership to get the spare tire replaced. At the time, the car mechanic actually informed Micah that they found a GPS tracking device on the car. It's believed that obviously John Paul is responsible for the damage to the tire. This also confirms Micah's worries that she was being followed and tracked again, probably by John Paul. After discovering this, she immediately went to the local magistrate's office with a police officer to get a restraining order against John Paul. While there, the officer noticed a white Honda Accord slowly driving by the office before speeding up and driving away. Micah told the officer that it was her husband in her car. She then handed the tracking device over to the police for them to continue their investigation. According to Micah's brother, Micah actually forwarded him an email where John Paul was apologizing for the damage done to her tires. He said in the email that he became angry when Micah confided in or put her family before him, and when she did this, it made him want to hurt her. He stated in the email, quote, when someone hurts me, I try to hurt them back rather than forgive, going on to say, instead of me forgiving you, I just attack and try to cause pain. That statement is very self-explanatory. By April of 2024, Micah told her brother about some legal documents that she had prepared so that her brother would be the one making decisions about her well-being. However, when he tried gaining access to those documents, he realized that they were gone. The only documents that he could find were the ones that appointed John Paul as her power of attorney. That same month, a week before her death, as Michael was dealing with these struggles, going through the abuse, and all the mounting stresses of it all, Micah posted a video to social media. She spoke about her abuse and offered support to viewers who are struggling with leaving a dangerous situation because they think God will be mad at them. So today my heart's a little heavy. Um, I've had a lot of women that have reached out to me about um, situations of abuse. And 
I just want to tell you what a lot of people have told me uh, lately and reminded me because I think I forgot. I knew, but I for I pushed it in the back of my head um, just because of my situation. Um, but you are the bride of Christ. Before anybody else's bride, male or female, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what, what uh, gender you are. Abuse is abuse. And you are the bride of Christ. And my Bible says that he took all the abuse you could think of for you so that you didn't have to live that life of slavery and bondage and pain. Jesus took it all for you. So you don't have to stay in a abusive relationship, whether that's um, sexual, whether that's uh, somebody forcing you to take illegal drugs or alcohol abuse or physical abuse, uh, psychological abuse, making you think that this is all your fault or you're a bad mom or you're a bad wife or you're a bad husband or you're, um, you're not giving it your all when you know you are. God hates divorce, but why? According to everybody I've asked and the, the scriptures that I've found, it's because it hurts people. But does abuse hurt people? How do you think God feels about that? So I want to remind you like a bunch of people have been reminding me lately that I'm God's bride first. And even an earthly spouse who's a good spouse, when they know that their bride is being hurt, just imagine what an earthly spouse does. What do you think your heavenly spouse does? When you're the bride of Christ and he sees his bride going through abuse and hurt, what do you think he thinks about that? So encouragement in all this is you are the bride of Christ first before anybody else's. And he's got you. And he sees you. And he loves you. Finally, after all of this, Micah filed for divorce from John Paul for a second and final time. By April 25th, 2024, John Paul was served those divorce papers. Two days later, Micah is found dead. Then, just a few days ago, police released a detailed timeline of Micah's final hours. By April 27th, Micah is last seen via ring doorbell camera, leaving her residence at 10.13 a.m. before returning at 11 a.m. She then leaves her home for a second time by 11.38 a.m. By 12.12 12 p.m., Micah is seen on surveillance camera walking into a Dick's pawn shop, and at 12.13 p.m., she is seen buying a gun and ammunition. She leaves the store by 12.34 p.m. By 1.06 p.m., she is then seen traveling along Highway 501. At 2.54 p.m., Micah called 911 and told the dispatcher that she was at a national park. She asked if her phone could be traced, stating that her location was turned on. She then tells the dispatcher that she is about to kill herself and wants her family to know where to find her. The dispatcher tries gathering more information, but Micah ends the call abruptly. Robinson County 911, what's the address of your emergency? Hi, um, are you able to trace the location of my phone? You don't know where you're at? A national park. What's the phone number you're calling me from? 843-655-5200. Where's the park located at? In... Bear Bluff. I have my location on, I think, on my phone. Find my phone is on. I just did my share my location. Okay, I'm showing, um, I don't think you are in Robinson County. Yeah, at Lumber, the Lumber River State Park. In yeah, that's where I am. Okay. Tell me what's um happened. Um, 
I'm about to kill myself and I just want my family to know where to find me. Okay, ma'am. Just listen to what I'm saying, okay? Let me make sure I got the exact location where you're at, okay? Just one minute. After the call is placed by 3.50 p.m., officers are able to ping her phone location and arrive to Lumber River State Park. Officers scoured the area of the state park and found Micah's car near the park. In the passenger seat of the car, investigators located a Sig Sauer gun case as well as a box of ammunition and the receipt for those items. As police searched the wooded area, a witness approached officers carrying a bag with items that belonged to Micah including her ID. The witness said that they saw a woman who was crying before hearing a gunshot go off while he was fishing. Another witness then called to inform officers that they discovered a body in the water. Officers went to that location where they then found 30-year-old Micah Miller deceased in the water within that national park. Located next to her was a Sig Sauer 9mm handgun that matched the serial number of the gun she purchased earlier that day. They also found her cell phone in the bag that the witness had. Upon investigating the phone, officers found a Google search for national parks near me. Then they found GPS data searching for Lumber River State Park and the phone traveling in that direction. After finding Micah's body, she was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner determined that she had died from a single gunshot wound to her head and ruled that her cause of death was a suicide. We don't know much more information beyond that. The medical examiner did state, though, that the wound was not to the back of her head as it had been speculated. The day after Micah's untimely and tragic death, John Paul went back to the church to deliver a sermon, and at the very end of the service, he took a moment to speak on his wife's death. He said that he got a call late last night informing him that his wife had died the night prior. He said that it was a self-inflicted death, going on to say that she had mental health issues and hadn't been taking her medication. He then announced that he was going to be taking a break from the church to grieve and heal in peace. We're not going to do an altar call today. Instead, um, instead um, I'm going to have you stand up and I'm going to make an announcement. And um, after the announcement, I'm going to ask that you... Um, you leave church quietly and, and don't talk about the announcement here in the building, please, if you can, so y'all can stand to your feet. Um, before I make the announcement, I also want to say that um, my request to you is that you will continue to come to church and serve and give um, for the next, you know, little bit, because I don't want to have, I'm taking a little bit of a break, and I don't want to have to worry about the church. My break may be a few days, a few weeks, I don't know. Um, I got a call late last night. My wife has passed away. And yeah, it was uh, it was self-induced, and it was uh, up in North Carolina. And um, we're gonna have a funeral for her next Sunday here at 3 p.m. And so um, it's, it's all I can. Yeah, I'm I'm just kind of going on um, adrenaline right now. So, so y'all pray for me and my kids and everybody. And uh, she was she wasn't y'all knew that she wasn't well mentally, and that uh, she needed her, her medicine that was hard to get to her. And so um, I'm sure there'll be more details to come, but um, just keep our family in your prayers. And I'm going to let Pastor Randall, my bishop, uh, he can pray. I'll get him a microphone. He'll pray out. And if you have anything you want to share as well, uh, I appreciate it. In the days and weeks after Micah's death, those who knew the couple, as well as people all over the country and in the media, have been going wild with speculations and calling Micah's death into question. Did she really kill herself? Or was her husband responsible? I'd say that literally everyone who took a quick look into this case can see that Micah was being abused and harassed before her death and she was afraid for her life. She filed for divorce two days before she was found dead, which is not a coincidence. She also told her sister that if she found a bullet in her head, it was John Paul, and then she was found with a bullet in her head. To add to that, after her death, News came out that John Paul was actually in a relationship with another woman prior to his divorce from Micah. 44-year-old John Paul was seeing a waitress, Christiana. The two met when she waited on his table and he left her a 50% tip as well as his phone number. 
In the course of them talking, by March 4th, flirty messages were found between the two. John Paul is asking for a selfie, Christiana sends one, and he tells her how beautiful she is. But sometime after the two started talking, Christiana got the feeling that John Paul was a married man. She said that there were some red flags that she noticed, and she had also talked to others who knew John Paul from the church, who all spoke of the very negative interactions and disturbing behaviors he showed. After confirming that he was married when he found Micah's Facebook page, she said that she wanted to send Micah a message to warn her that he was talking to another woman, but Christiana could tell that her Facebook was being operated by John Paul, so she decided not to message her. Then, the day after Micah died, when Christiana saw the news, she texted John Paul asking him if anything was new. He replied, yes, lots is new, lol, I'll text you later. Knowing that his wife just died, obviously, Christiana was very disturbed by this response, literally saying laugh out loud when referring to his wife's very recent death. Once again, obviously, these are all very suspicious circumstances that all point directly towards John Paul as possibly being involved in his wife's death. So, of course, after Micah's death, police investigated John Paul's whereabouts in the days and hours surrounding. Plate readers from the interstate showed that on the evening of April 26th, John Paul traveled from Myrtle Beach to Charleston for a sporting event. His presence at the sporting event was confirmed by a witness. By April 27th, the day of Micah's death, John Paul's truck was spotted driving along the highway heading from the direction of Charleston back to Myrtle Beach. By 1.35, he is seen at 41 Grocery Store and Grill, which according to Google Maps, is about a 41-minute drive away from Lumber River State Park. Then, as we know, by 2.54 p.m., Micah called the police to inform them that she was going to take her own life. In the call, she sounds eerily calm and matter-of-fact, stating that she just wants her family to find her body. So, with all of this information, it does clear up a lot of the speculation that has been circulating online. It appears that just before Micah called the authorities to notify them of her death, John Paul was 41 minutes away. Now, I will say that technically, if he drove directly from the 41 grocery store to Lumber River State Park, leaving at 1.35 p.m., he would have arrived around 2.15 p.m., which gives 30 minutes before the call was made. So, there is still speculation that something could have happened within that short period of time. If he arrived to the state park, found her, and forced her to make that call in that short period of time... However, with what we know, I do think that's a little bit of a stretch. Micah went and bought the gun and is even seen kind of smiling in the surveillance video. She researched the national parks in her area. She drove herself to the Lumber State Park. There is no information on either Micah or John Paul's phone to show that he knew where Micah would be or that he planned on visiting that area. There's no information to show that he was even in that area at all, regardless of how close he was within that 30 minutes before the call was made. So, even though this definitely isn't what anyone wants to believe, all of the evidence so far points towards Micah taking her own life. It's tragic and heartbreaking and very unexpected, but that's what the information indicates. Now, if there is more information that comes out that says this might not be the case, then I wouldn't necessarily be surprised, but as of right now, Micah taking her own life is the most likely scenario here. Now, with that being said, do I still think that John Paul, in a way, bears responsibility? Absolutely. He allegedly abused her. He clearly was planning on making her life as difficult as possible after the divorce. She feared him and he was not going to let her prove to anybody that he was abusive. He was stalking her. He was controlling her. So regardless of what happened, it is not a coincidence that she died two days after filing for divorce. While I'm not going to sit here and speculate on why Micah might have chosen to do this, I will say that I believe all of these factors played into that decision. We might find out information 
about those two days that gives us more about what happened that may have caused this to happen. But even if we don't, all of this information really gives us a good picture of why this happened. She may have felt extremely trapped. She may have felt like there was no way out, that this was the only option. Beyond that though, I'm not going to speculate because the only person who could truly tell us is no longer here. So that is what we know at this point in this tragic, heartbreaking case. With all that's been said, I do want to echo the sentiment that Micah said in her own video. If you are dealing with an abusive situation, please do what you can to leave. If you're being pressured by an external force to stay, please listen to yourself force. Listen to your own gut. And if you are ever in a position where you feel that taking your own life is the only way out, I promise you there is always another way. No matter what you're dealing with, there is always a light at the end of the tunnel and you will get through it. Just know that there are people around you and people out there who care about you and want what's best for you. That includes me. So if you or a loved one is struggling with mental health or thoughts of hurting yourself, I will leave some resources for you down below. But with that being said, that is where I'm going to end today's video and now I want to know what you all think. What do you think is going on here? Do you agree that the evidence points towards this being a tragic suicide or do you think we will uncover something else that blows the whole case wide open? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn those notification bells to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure to follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.